Genesis chapter 16, continuing with the journey through Genesis. We made it through to Genesis chapter 16. And in Genesis chapter 16, Abram and Sarai fell on waiting on the Lord. You see, Abram was told that he would have a child with Sarai, and from that child would come an innumerable amount of children. She gets impatient, and she wants Abram to have a child by Hagar, her Egyptian servant. So he does. And from this relationship comes the wild man, Ishmael. He was born to be wild. It even calls him a wild man. The Lord says he shall be a wild man. And from him would come innumerable enemies of God's people. And that's the price of not waiting on the Lord. But then in Genesis 17, the Lord appears to Abraham when he is 99. And he gets his, Abram gets his name changed to Abraham. And Abraham means the father of many nations. But the Lord reminds Abraham of his covenant with him. He reminds him of how he's going to have a great seed and have a land grant as an everlasting possession. And he then gives him the token of the covenant, which is circumcision. You know, uh, I've heard about some people being completely against circumcision, which I don't believe you have to be circumcised, but they they treat it as if it's a sin to be circumcised. But I don't I don't see that because God's commanding people to be circumcised in the Bible. So how could it be wrong? Now it's wrong if you're linking that up to your salvation or telling people that they have to. I mean, obviously it's an option now. But to, to go to the opposite extreme and say that it's wrong or a sin, that's just, I think that's taking it too far. Just as, you know, somebody saying, well, it's uh, required for salvation, like they were doing in the book of Acts and stuff. And, you know, Paul's going against that in the book of Galatians. It's wrong to say it's for salvation, and it's wrong to say that it's wrong to do it. So, you know, you just want to have a balanced view on stuff. But this was God's token of the covenant. It says in Genesis 17, 11, And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man-child in your generations, he that is born in the house, are bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. You see, the physical circumcision is a picture of the spiritual circumcision that you got when you got saved. When you got saved, the Lord cut your soul loose from your flesh. That is called the circumcision made without hands in Colossians 2.11. And when that happens, you become a new creature. That's a new beginning. So it makes perfect sense for the Lord to have Abraham circumcise every man-child when they're eight days old because eight is the number of new beginnings. And the Lord tells Abraham that he's going to have a son by Sarai in the next year and notice his reaction in Genesis 17, 17. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old and shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? I've heard some people say that Abraham is you know, laughing out of joy and stuff, but it just really looks like to me that he's laughing because it sounds so wild that he could have a child that old. Just like, you know, Sarah laughs in her tent when she's told that she's going to have a child that old. But both Abraham and Sarah laugh at the idea of having a child in their old age. But when it talks about Abraham's faith in the New Testament, it doesn't mention that. This is because in the New Testament, Abraham's sins are under the blood. You know... God focuses more on the good of these Old Testament characters rather than talking about their faults and their sins. In Genesis chapter 18, you got the Lord appears to Abraham accompanied with two angels. So here comes the Lord and two angels, and the Lord tells Abraham once again that he will have a son in his old age. Sarah thinks it's hilarious because how could they possibly have children at that age. And Genesis eighteen thirteen through 14, And the Lord said to Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, 
saying, Surely I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. So Abraham laughed, Sarah laughed, and that's why their son's name is going to be Isaac. It means laughter. But the Lord also lets Abraham know that Sodom and Gomorrah is about to be burned off the map. In Genesis 18, 20, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. See, and then Abraham, in this chapter, intercedes because he knows Lot is over there in Sodom, and he doesn't want the Lord to destroy it because he's worried about his nephew Lot. But it turns out that Lot is the only good guy over in Sodom, so the only logical thing to do is remove Lot and his family from Sodom and then torch the place. But what you have in Genesis 19 is the two angels going to visit Lot in Sodom, going to get try to get him out of there and his family out of there. So they come to Lot's house, and he gets them to come in. He gets the angels to come in. They're just going to stay out in the street all night. That shows you that angels are rough characters, going to stay out all night in a place like Sodom. But then you know the story. The Sodomites circle around the house because they want to have sex with the angels. And in Genesis 19, 4 through 5, it says, But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Now, you, like in the Schofield Reference Bible, it says that angels are sexless. But that doesn't make any sense because each time you read about angels, it calls them men or young men or young man. Why does it call them men or young men or young man if they're sexless? And you say, well, it just refers to them as men. But what about those uh, spirits in Zechariah 5? It refers to them as uh, women. So this shows you that Angels are men. There's no female angels. And certainly there they wouldn't be sexless. But um, where are the men which came into thee this night? They say, bring them out unto us that we may know them. And they didn't want to ask their name, their number or their date of birth or what their hobby is. They want to know them, know them. They want to know them physically because they're sodomites and angels are men. They look like regular men. That's why you can entertain angels unawares because they look just like regular men. They don't have halos. They don't have wings. I don't even think that they're j just great and gigantic creatures or nothing. They just look like your average man. Maybe a little bit bigger, but probably not anything special looking about them. But Lot is so messed up. Uh, Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do ye to, to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. Lot is so messed up in his mind that he would allow his two daughters to go out there with these wicked sodomites. Notice he tells them to do ye unto them as is good in your eyes. You see, this is why you can't live your life by what is good in your eyes and go by how you feel. What is good in someone's eyes may be wicked according to the Bible. You can't go by how you feel. What you feel may be sick and twisted. What if Ted Bundy just lived his life by how he felt and it was legal for him to do that? Because, you know, he can't help that he feels that way. Or he can't help who he loves. What if Jeffrey Dahmer could kill men and eat their dead bodies and it was okay because, you know, everyone used the reasoning, well, you can't help who you love. That's crazy. You can't help how you feel. Just do what makes you happy. Do what's good in your eyes. You do what you think's right, Jeffrey. 
You do what you, you think is right, Mr. Bundy. That's crazy. You can't live your life according to what you think is right, according to what how you feel. That's what was wrong with him in the book of Judges. That's why Judges is one of the most strangest book in the Bible because it says every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You can't do what's right in your own eyes. You've got to find out what's right in the Bible and then do that. But Lot escaped Sodom. However, only his two daughters made it out with him. Lot ends up drunk and committing incest with his two daughters, which leads to both daughters being pregnant by Lot, and the two sons would become the Ammonites and Moabites, enemies of the Lord's people. So once again, you got something bad happening and uh, children being born that lead to innumerable amounts of enemies to God's people. Just like what happened with Abraham and Sarah when Abraham had a child by Hagar, Ishmael, which would lead to enemies of God's people. Then you got Genesis 20. Abimelech takes Sarah, not knowing she is Abraham's wife. But Abraham lies again about his wife. And I mean, you'd think someone who took down five armies, someone like Abraham who took down five armies with 318 men, that's all he had was 318 men, you would think he wouldn't have any problems letting the world know who his wife is and then cracking skulls when they tried to flirt with her. But in Genesis 20, 2 through 3, And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. He thinks, well, she's just his sister. She looks pretty good. I'm going to take her to my house. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. This is one of my favorite verses. Because if you have a good looking wife, then you're used to idiots like Abimelech trying to take your wife or your girlfriend, whoever it is. And I just hope that anyone who's ever tried to take my wife has had God appear to them in a dream at night telling them that thou art but a dead man. I hope that that happens. But the Lord has Abraham's back. Don't you remember he said, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. I hope if someone messes with my wife, the Lord will come to them in a dream and be much more scary than Freddy Krueger. I hope that they don't even want to go to sleep at night anymore because of the Lord appearing to them in a dream about trying to take my wife. Genesis 21, you got the birth of Isaac. Genesis 21, 1. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. Notice it says, as he had said. The best thing to do is just to take God at what he says and then wait on it to happen. Abraham and Sarah jumped the gun, and Abraham got with Hagar. They should have just listened to the Lord and believed it as he had said it. Because look what's happening here. Genesis 21, 2 through 3. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. Isaac means laughter. Because remember, they both laughed when the Lord told them they would have a son in their old age. Abraham has gotten his son Isaac. And now he's going to go through the greatest trial of his life, with his son Isaac in Genesis 22. And in Genesis 22, you got the famous chapter about God telling Abraham to, that he's going to have to sacrifice Isaac. So the Lord has Abraham to go up to sacrifice Isaac, and Isaac would have been the most precious thing in Abraham's life at that time. The promised seed that he'd been waiting on all this time Genesis 22, 6, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. Now the wood that he laid on Isaac can picture the cross. He laid it, laid it upon Isaac his son. The father laid the cross on his son, the Lord Jesus. So you see how this whole story is a picture of the son laying down his life. 
and that it's the will of the Father for him to lay down his life. Genesis 22, 7 through 8. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire in the wood, but where is the lamb for the burn off, for a burnt offering? You know, they're going up that mountain, and Isaac's like, We got all this stuff to do an offering, but where's the lamb? He don't know yet that he's going to be the sacrifice. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Notice that great phrase, God will provide himself a lamb. You see, God himself becomes the lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. That's the Lord Jesus. And you know the story. Abraham is about to go through with what exactly what God told him to do. He had that knife up in the air about to sacrifice Isaac, and then the angel of the Lord stops him just in the nick of time. And then they find a ram caught in a thicket and sacrifice that ram instead of Isaac. And the amazing thing is, the ram then becomes the picture of Jesus because the ram was caught in a thicket by its head and that pictures Jesus Christ having on a crown of thorns. An amazing story showing you great typology in the Bible. But time moves on. Abraham has spent many years with Sarah and in Genesis 23, you got Sarah's death and burial. And Abraham needs to buy a burying place for Sarah, so he talks to the sons of Heth about getting a burying place from them, and what shall Abraham handles the situation. In Genesis 23, 10 through 13, it says, And Ephron dwelled among the children of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the audience of the children of Heth, even of all that, that went in at the gate of this, his city, saying, Nay, my Lord, hear me. The field I give I thee, and the cave that is therein I give it thee, and the presence of my people give I it thee, bury thy dead. So he's just going to give it to Abraham. And Abraham bowed himself before the people of the land. And he spake unto Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me, I will give thee money for the field, take it of me, and I will bury my dead there. You see, Abraham wanted to pay his way. The man was just going to let him have it. You see, when you're getting something from someone, and they say, don't worry about paying, just try your best to pay them anyway. It's just being courteous. If someone has given you a ride to work, don't just offer to pay for the gas. Don't even offer. Just put the money in their pocket. Just put the gas in their car. Don't make it awkward by asking them. You know, if you just say, do you need gas money? Most likely they're going to say no. Nobody else will say, yeah, give me the money for the gas. Don't make it awkward by asking them. Just hand over the money. Put the money in the car somewhere. Find a way to get the gas in their car. Just be courteous about it. Pay your way. You just need to go ahead and give them the gas money or whatever type of money it is that you could owe that person for that favor that they did for you. Genesis 24, the great chapter on finding a bride for Isaac. It says in Genesis 24, Abraham, you see in Genesis 24, Abraham is just telling his servant not to take a wife of the daughters of the Canaanites, and I don't believe this has to do with being against race mixing. It's about the fact that the Canaanites are a wicked people involved in idolatry and marrying wives of these other races who are involved in all this idolatry and stuff. It's not bad because they're of another race. It's bad because it's going to turn away God's people's heart from the Lord, just like it did with Solomon. You know, Solomon got with all these strange wives and his heart was turned away from the Lord and in Genesis 24 4 it says but thou shalt go into my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac Abraham's servant finds a wife for Isaac her name is Rebecca and she comes to be the bride of Isaac of her own free will they even give her the option you know you want to stay here with us with your family or do you want to go and in Genesis 24, 58, she says these great words. 
And they called Rebekah and said to her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. Just like you chose to be a part of the bride of Christ of your own free will. You said, I will go, when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. She said, I will go, when they asked her about going to marry Isaac. And in Genesis twenty four sixty seven, it says, And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So Rebekah became Isaac's wife. And through them, they're going to continue bringing in the seed, that promised seed. You know, Abraham had Isaac. Now Isaac's going to have children. And from there, it's going to make up the children of Israel. Isaac's going to have Jacob and Esau. Jacob's going to have his 12 sons. And those 12 sons are going to make up the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. But in Genesis 25, you got the death of Abraham. In Genesis 25, 8, it says, Then Abraham gave up the ghosts and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Abraham is full of years. And right now you may be young and you're not ready to die. You may be ready to die in the sense you're saved and that you desire heaven, but still there is something in you that hungers to live. If you've talked to old people who are about to die, a lot of times they say they are just ready to go. They are full of days. They don't hunger any more of this life. They are satisfied. They're ready to go. They're old and full of years. Just like you'd get full off of food. They're full off of years. And in Genesis twenty five seventeen it says, And these are the years of the life of Ishmael, 130 and 7 years, and he gave up the ghost and died, and was gathered unto his people. If Abraham was 86 when Ishmael was born, and Ishmael died at 137, then Abraham lived 51 years of Ishmael's life. That's pretty good considering Abraham was already old when he had Ishmael. But if you're blessed to live many years on this earth with your child, then consider it a good thing. And I understand that Ishmael's relationship with Abraham wasn't like it was, was with Ishmael. Isaac, but hopefully your relationship with your child is in good standing. Don't waste the years with them. Make memories with your kids. They remember the little things you do with them, like playing outside, reading them books, teaching them a Bible story. You know, leave something behind. Leave a marked up Bible behind. Record your voice saying something about the Lord, expounding the Bible or just even a testimony of some sort, leave it behind for your children so that you, you live on through those things with your children. But in this chapter, you also got the birth of Jacob and Esau. Isaac's going to have two boys with Rebekah. In Genesis 25, 24 through 26, it says, And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over like an hairy garment. And they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out and his hand took hold on Esau's heel and his name was called Jacob and Isaac was three score years old when she bare them so Jacob means supplanter that means to take the place of to overthrow to undermine Jacob even in the womb was wanting to be the firstborn and come out in first place he's all about me first and you next now God used Jacob to bring about the 12 tribes and later changes his name to Israel and that is why the Jews are called the children of Israel but Jacob isn't the greatest character in the Bible I think he's one of my least favorite characters in the Bible but he's probably the character that's most like us he's pretty sorry in many ways in Genesis 26 you got the promise given to Isaac just as the Lord promised to Abraham that he would give that he would have an innumerable seed and the land he gives the same promise to Isaac he says in Genesis 26 3 through 5 sojourn in this land and I will be with thee and will bless thee for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father and I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven 
and will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Isaac follows in the footsteps of his father Abraham and lies about his wife. In Genesis 26, 6 through 7, And Isaac dwelt in Gerar, and the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, She is my sister. For he feared to say, She is my wife, lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. Remember that the things you do in your ways will rub off on your kids. What Abraham did, it rubbed off on Isaac. This is why they say, like father, like son. And what this pictures is a member of the bride of Christ being afraid to let the world know that she's married to Jesus. You see, Rebecca didn't let them know she's remarried to Isaac. And that's what that picture is. Have you ever gone to work and you was afraid to let these people know that you're married to the Lord Jesus Christ? You're part of the bride of Christ? Genesis 26, 18 through 19. And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the, list, for the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. You see, the world wants to stop up your well. Whether it be a Bible corrector who stops up your well by causing you to not to have complete faith in the book, or it could be an atheist that makes you think there is nothing to the book, or someone who wants all your time so that you can't even get in the book. They're trying to stop up your well. And if something has stopped up your well, then just start digging again, and you're going to hit water. But Isaac's son Esau is a rebel, and he's staying out all night chasing wild women. In Genesis 36, or Genesis 26, 34 through 35, And Esau was forty years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Beshemath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. So be careful who you marry. They help determine how the rest of your life's going to play out, and they affect everyone around you. They were a grief of mind to Esau's parents. A girl can marry the wrong guy, and he'll be a grief of mind to her parents the rest of their life. He won't work. He won't take care of the kids. He just sits around and drinks and plays video games. You don't want to marry somebody like that who's going to be a grief of mind to everybody around you in your life. Isaac has trouble with Esau, but he also has trouble with Jacob. In Genesis 27, we see that Jacob ain't being the greatest son in the world. Jacob tricks Isaac. Jacob and his mother come up with this scheme to trick Isaac into blessing him instead of Esau because Jacob is a schemer, remember. He's a supplanter. But his mom puts goat's hair on his arms and attempt to make Isaac, who's blind as a bat, to think that Jacob is Esau because Esau is really hairy. And, you know, if, if Isaac comes in with goat's hair on his arms and it Isaac's going to feel Jacob, and he's going to be like, wow, this is Esau. He's, he's awfully hairy. So to think, so to confuse the two, she puts goat's hair on Jacob. And it says in verse 22, And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy, as his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. So Jacob tricks Isaac into giving him the blessing. He literally pulled the wool over his eyes. Literally. And you literally can't trust your feelings right here. But Jacob gets the blessing. And Esau is all tore up. So in Genesis 28, Jacob goes to stay with Laban, his mother's brother, and Esau finds out that Jacob's going to stay with Laban and that Rebekah doesn't want Jacob to take a daughter of the Canaanites. So Esau takes another wife that his parents wouldn't approve of just for spite. And Jacob has a dream from the Lord about a ladder coming down from heaven with the Lord standing above it. And the Lord gives him the same promise that he gave to Abraham and that he gave to Isaac. 
in Genesis 28, 13 through 14, it says, And behold, the Lord stood above it, talking about the ladder, and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it, and to thy seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee, and in thy seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So he's given this promise to Abraham. He's given this promise to Isaac. And now he's given this promise to Jacob. Genesis 29. In Genesis 29, Jacob is now going to meet Laban, his mother's brother, and Laban's daughter, Rachel. And Jacob begins to work for Laban and says he's going to serve him seven years for his daughter, Rachel. He must have really wanted his daughter, Rachel. And in verse 16, And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. You see, time flies when you're having fun or you're doing something you love with someone you love or doing something for somebody you love. And it seemed to Jacob but a few days, these seven years. And think back about the past seven years, especially if you've enjoyed what you've been doing. It's gone by really, really fast. It doesn't seem like it's been three years, probably. So think about this. You need to set some goals for yourself. And think about this. If you set some type of Bible reading goal or Bible study goal or some goal to have something finished within seven years, them seven years, it's going to fly by. Right now you think, wow, seven years, that's a long time. But it's literally going to fly by. And at the end of that seven years, you can look back and say that you finished that goal, whatever it is. You know, I have goals of things I want to have done in seven years, in 10 years, 15 years. It's going to go by fast. It's going to seem to you as just a few days. When the seven years is all said and done, it's not going to seem like seven years. I mean, when I think back seven years ago, I can't believe that it's actually been seven years. But in the story here, it turns out that Laban tricks Jacob. And after that seven years, he gives him the wrong daughter on purpose. He gives him Leah, the elder, instead of Rachel, the younger. And this is an example of sowing and reaping. Because remember, Jacob just tricked his father Isaac. And so, in return, he gets tricked by Laban. So Jacob has to work another seven years for Rachel. So he ends up putting in 14 years before he can even get Rachel. And there are things that are worth your time. It's worth spending 14 years in something that's worthwhile. For Jacob, getting Rachel, spending 14 years working, it was worthwhile. There are things that you can be doing today for the rest of your life, and it's going to be worth your time. You don't want to waste your time, your time that's going to seem but a few days when it's all said and done. But Re Jacob, he finally gets Rachel. It turns out Rachel can't have children. And God sees that Jacob loves Rachel more than he does Leah, so he makes it to where Leah can have children. And Leah has four sons in chapter 29. She has Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And these sons of Jacob are going to be big characters in the Bible. And in Genesis chapter 30, Rachel tells Jacob that he's going to have to give her some children. She says, give me children, else I die. 
notice the attitude of women having chi- of wanting to have children back then and in this culture compared to what it is today in this culture you got women who would rather die themselves than to have children and here Rachel says give me children else I die you know she wants children so bad that she would rather die than to not have any and Rachel is in such a hurry to have children, kind of like Sarah was with Abraham. Remember, Sarah gave Abraham Hagar because she was in such a rush to have a child. So Rachel gives Bilhah, her handmaid, to Jacob to wife so that he can have children by her. And through Bilhah, Jacob has two more sons. He's already got the four. Now he's going to have two more with this woman, Bilhah. And he's going to have Dan and Naphtali. And then Leah sees that she has quit producing children for Jacob herself, so she gives Jacob her handmaid Zilpah, and she gives she this Zilpah also gives Jacob a couple sons. She gives him Gad and Asher. Leah ends up giving Jacob two more boys herself again, as well, named Issachar and Zebulun, and a daughter named Dinah. So Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, and Dinah. He's already having tons of children. And finally, Rachel has a son, and they call his name Joseph. And Jacob desires to leave Laban. He's He's got... T- four wives now he's got all these kids he's ready to go back he's ready to go back home and in genesis thirty twenty seven, and laban said to him i pray thee if i have found favor in thine eyes tarry for i have learned by experience that the lord hath blessed me for thy sake you see laban realizes that he's being blessed just by being around jacob And that's fulfilling the promise that God gave to Abraham. I will bless thee that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. But uh, Jacob just can't get away from Laban. So he has to take off without him even knowing about it. And in Genesis 31, Jacob flees Laban. Laban goes after him, but Jacob is lucky that he has connections with the Lord because the Lord told Laban not to speak to Jacob either good or bad. Because Laban's pretty hot about this. The bad thing is, though, that Rachel stole some of Laban's gods. She stole some of her father's gods and took them with her when they left. And let that remind you that your kids will take your false gods with them when they leave home. If you've got some type of false god, obviously you probably don't have some type of statue or something that you set up in your house and that's your little god. But you've got your little gods. All those things that you're putting before God, your kids will put that before God. And they'll take it with them when they leave home. And it will cause their children to take in these false gods. So remember that. She took those false gods with her when she left home. And in Genesis 32... Jacob fears Esau. Jacob just can't be, he just can't get a feeling of security, even though he's got all these promises from God, even though God literally sends angels down to help him, to go with him. He is still in fear. And he's in such fear that he finally humbles himself and seeks out the Lord because he's so afraid of Esau. The thing is, though, that Jacob shouldn't be so fearful of men, and he already knows that God is with him, and the angels of God are with him, and he has all these promises from God that he just forgets all about. That's just like us. We got all these promises from God. We know we have eternal security. We know we're going to heaven when we die. We know that God's with us, and he's never going to leave us or forsake us, yet we still are afraid. We are still we still get afraid of men who... All they can do is kill the body. They can't kill the soul. Yet, we're just like Jacob. Uh, Jacob's one of my least favorite characters in the Bible, and it's probably probably because he's more like me than any other character in the Bible. He does some stupid stuff. 
and he's so fearful and, and a schemer and deceitful, just like us. You know, we want to imagine ourselves as somebody like David when he killed Goliath or somebody like that. But when it comes right down to it, we're more like Jacob. But Jacob wrestles with God in Genesis 32, 27 through 28. And this is the angel of the Lord that Jacob is wrestling with. And the angel of the Lord there is a pre-appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he ends up getting his name changed to Israel here in this chapter. In Genesis 32, it says, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. So his name is changed to Israel, and that's why they are called the children of Israel. When you're reading about Israel, you ever thought about this? Why are they called Israel? Why are they called the children of Israel? Well, because Jacob got his name changed to Israel. Jacob has 12 sons that make up the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's why they're called Israelites. They are Hebrews because they came from Abraham, who is from the line of Eber. You know, Eber, like Hebrews. And they're later called Jews because of Judah. You know, uh, like a short shortening of that name, Jew, Judah. So, and the, the, even though there's just one tribe, Judah's just one tribe, all, the, all of them end up being called Jews. So that's where all the different names come from. You know, they're called children of Israel because Jacob's name is changed to Israel. They're Hebrews because Abraham is a Hebrew. He came from the line of Eber. And they end up being called Jews because of Judah. In Genesis 33, Jacob meets Esau. And it wasn't nothing like he thought it would be. Esau had already cooled off after all these years of being mad. He's cooled off now. And he was actually happy to see Jacob. Jacob got all tore up for nothing. He thought that Esau was going to kill him. And most times that's what happens when you get all tore up. You're tore up for no reason. The best thing to do is just face whatever it is you're afraid of. And you're going to find it's most likely not nowhere near as bad as you thought it was going to be. And in Genesis 34, you got the chapter where Dinah is defiled. Dinah, Jacob's daughter, she gets defiled by Shechem. In Genesis 31, 34, 1 and 2, And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she burned to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. So she's just going out, trying to make some friends. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. Notice Shechem first saw her. He saw her first, and he took her. So it starts with a look. And in 2022, the temptation is placed in front of your eyes everywhere you look. No matter where you turn your head, there's the temptation. It starts with a look. So you just got to keep looking straight and you'll go past the temptation. And you can't help what goes in front of your eyes, but you don't have to keep it in front of your eyes. In Proverbs 4.25, it says, Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. You see... It started with a look for Shechem. It led to him taking Dinah, defiling her. Then, if you read the story, you know her brothers get very angry. And her brothers end up killing the, that entire village of people. Jacob's boys, Dinah's brothers, talk Shechem and the children of Hamor into getting circumcised. They say, you know, if you get circumcised... We'll let you marry our women. We'll marry your women. We can share everything each other has. And they're like, okay, we'll do that. We'll get circumcised. And then they, then when they got circumcised and they're healing up after the, they hit their cuts are healing up from the circumcision. Here comes Simeon and Levi, in Genesis thirty-four twenty-five through twenty-seven, and it came to pass on the third day when they were sore that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, 
took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males and slew Hamar, Hamor and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. Even though all the males were sore. This is still a pretty crazy thing. It shows that Jacob had raised some rough, mean, and angry sons. For just Simeon and Levi to be able to go in and kill all the males, that's a wild story. That shows some anger and rage and just cruelty on their part. It caused them to lose out on the birthright later on. You see, Reuben was first in line for it, and he's going to lose the birthright later. Simeon and Levi lose out on it because of this event here. So it's going to fall on Judah. You know, it was it went Reuben, Simeon, Levi. Them three lose out on the birthright. Next one in line is Judah. So Jesus Christ ends up coming from the tribe of Judah. Now, in Genesis 35, you got the chapter where Jacob is going to go back to Bethel. Genesis 35, 1, And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God, that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. And you've probably heard sermons called Back to Bethel, about going back to the place where you met God or got right with God, back to the place where you first fell in love with God in the Bible. And that comes from this verse. Jacob is going back to Bethel, and he's cleaning things up. In verse 2 it says, Then Jacob said to his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. You see, anything can become a god. Examine yourself, and find out if there's anything in your life that comes before God, and that is a false god in your life. Jacob tells his household, Put away the strange gods that are among you. That's what you need to do. Look at your life. Examine yourself, and then put away the strange gods that are among you. He says in verse 3, And let us arise and go up to Bethel. Go back to that place where you met God. May, obviously, probably not the physical place, but the place where when you first fell in love with God in the Bible, go back to that place. Repent and do the first works. Go back and do the things that you were doing when you first fell in love with God in the Bible. He says, And I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. You see, Jacob is lighting his load. Sin is heavy. And that is why you need to lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. He's telling them, bring all these strange gods, the earrings that are in your ears, and everything that you're putting ahead of God. Earrings aren't bad, but they are when you, you love your material things more than you do God. So they bring all their strange gods, and they lighten their load. And then in this chapter, Rachel, Jacob's wife, dies giving birth to another son named Benjamin. And in Genesis thirty-five twenty-two, and it came to pass when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. So you, that's Reuben goes to bed with Jacob, Jacob's wife, Bilhah, and he hears about it. So in this chapter, you've got just some bad things happening to Jacob. He... Loses his wife. One of his sons uh, betrays him. Gets with one, another one of his wives. And Reuben messed up big time. He laid with one of his father's wives. And that knocks him out of the birthright. Just like Simeon and Levi are knocked out of the birthright. So it's going to go to Judah. 